Yeah, so just some some basic thyroid stuff. So obviously, it's a pretty famous you know, hormone gland um, because it controls our metabolism. It's, there, it's actually a rampant problem right now because everyone's taking biotin, which is a fine supplement. You know, you need it. It's you know probably good for skin and hair and you know maybe some other things. But um, and it's not bad for the thyroid at all. It just screws up the lab, so you're going to end up going down a rabbit hole when the doctor goes, "Oh, whoa, what's going on?" And uh, you know nobody realize that they should either say or ask about biotin it's it's a it's a fascinating thing you know no weight gain maybe they end up feeling just amazing when we replace their thyroid hormone but they're otherwise just hanging in there <laughs> you know oh i didn't even realize something was wrong okay and it's like whoa how are you even still functioning right now and everyone's different everyone has different genetics um, everyone has different lifestyle things everyone has different ailments and uh you know we just try to optimize each of those aspects the best we can uh thank you for your time I know you're a yeah. busy man. Um, <laughs> I know we're going to touch on thyroid and as many things as we can because it's a really complex, you know, um, misconception about the things that are going on and lots of problems that literally happen really often. People don't know what to do. And there's so much BS out there. Um, yeah. Uh, who's Dr. Nadolsky? Who's the doctor that lifts? So, um, well, I'm a, uh, a board-certified endocrinologist and uh, a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. Uh, went to Michigan State University, wrestled for Michigan State, very proud of my Spartan heritage, and um, then went on to medical school at Nova Southeastern, and uh, I did uh, a Navy scholarship for that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then I did my internal medicine residency at uh, Portsmouth Naval Hospital near Norfolk, and uh, I was an internal medicine doctor on a ship for a year, and then Whoa. I was staff back at the uh, at the Portsmouth uh, Hospital for a year before going up to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center for endocrinology fellowship. Uh, all the while in there somewhere, I got uh, certified in obesity medicine, um, and then uh, I've been staff and part of the uh, fellowship program there, and uh, put together a comprehensive obesity comprehensive. Uh, you know, the ob intensive obesity treatment program there, and I am literally uh, separating from the military this week uh, to go up to back to Michigan, where I'm from, and uh, to join a big system up there that I think has a good philosophy and um, is is kind of taken over Western Michigan, and hopefully to do basically the same thing, be part of the endocrinology department, put together an intensive obesity program. And hopefully, still have my hand a little bit in the academics through Michigan State. So, that's the current future, and um, and of course, I think you know my my younger brother Spencer, who yes, uh, has, you know, kind of we've done a lot of the same things. Uh, we have a few different little niches, but otherwise, <laughs> kind of follow in my footsteps. And um, you know, he ended up doing family medicine, also does obesity medicine, and uh, is now doing some on like purely online uh, medical stuff right now and uh you know tries to reach out to the fitness pros for some of the same reasons we're talking about to try to get everybody on the same team make sure everyone's on the same page preaching the right stuff make sure people are talking to the right people <laughs> instead of whatever you know out there yeah 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 and that's the thing you and your brother you've created a big change uh regarding the way you think the way you're applying science and you keep it real in many yeah. aspects because it's a it's you know, when you talk about health and people, you know, sometimes get the wrong, I don't, I don't want to curse, but, uh, you know, read a magazine or hear somebody that's not well qualified, it yeah. tur turns out really badly. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's, it, it's tough. You know, I mean, you know, medicine and science in general, you know, there are a lot of you know, sometimes it's tough to debate the actual science, and then you start going on the fringe, and people want to, uh, you know, people are trying to make money, and, and uh, you know, we can debate politically on how much regulation we need where, but um, sometimes that's in the wrong places, and, uh, but if we really just all try to do kind of what's right, and um, and hopefully people will follow what's right, and, and, uh, and not being biased to what we <laughs> like, what is best for our Patient, yeah. client. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. I, I mean, you know, I know. I know. It's tough. <laughs> it is. 
So um, I'm really interested in learning, uh, like trying to dive and understand about the thyroid. Yeah. Can, can we just start? Well, well, yeah. So just some some basic thyroid stuff. So obviously, it's a pretty famous <laughs> you know, hormone gland um, because it controls our metabolism. Um, you know, and, and metabolic rate has to do with you know the energy we need and use to to function and live. Um, but of course, that leads to energy balance and things like that. So I, I tell my patients when I explain it, I'm, I say you know it's it goes to nuclear receptors and it's it's our heat and metabolism hormone, and that kind of lets them understand what it is. Um, so you know, energy utilization, oxygen consumption, heat production—that's kind of its its thing. And the actual gland. You know, most people know this, but it's it's right here. Mm -hmm. And when we examine it, we will either put two fingers right here and have patients swallow because it rises up. Or so, you know, you should, if it's big, you'll feel it. Um, but it's usually uh, just around 20 grams. So that's the normal size, um, just below the larynx. And, uh, and it produces mostly two hormones. And we'll just call them T4 and, and T3 for now. Um, and those travel throughout the body and, and do their thing. Um, it's controlled by thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, which is also pretty famous because it's one of the few hormones we can use pretty well to screen or, or monitor, uh, treatments and, and things like that. Um, you know, people like to argue that, but it, but it's a better than a lot of the other things we, we monitor. It's, it's, it stays in a pretty precise range. Mm -hmm. um, so it's released by the pituitary gland under control of the hypothalamus. And of course, there's that negative feedback. So the thyroid hormones uh, go back up to the hypothalamus and pituitary and control that TSH. And the TSH should stay in a pretty, you know, fairly tight range. And that can be personalized. And there are fluctuations and variations and all these things. And then in the, the bottom line is that throughout the body, T4 is actually converted to T3. And T3 is what does the work. That's what goes to the nuclei and, and receptors, and, and it does the work. And that's regulated by all sorts of things that we love and, and, and care about. Nutrition, um, other endocrine or hormone alterations. It's an orchestra. Um, and certainly, yeah, and certainly illness. So chronic illnesses, acute illnesses, that, that all changes that stuff. And that uh, can be confusing to some people. Yeah, so, and, uh, yeah. and that's the problem, like diagnosing thyroid. And, you know, it's, it depends on many factors, as you said, but are there any obvious signs? Like, how can Yeah, we... so, um, so obviously there are lots of things that can go wrong with the thyroid, just like any part of our body. Um, for this gland, what you hear about most is hypothyroidism, low thyroid hormone, because if you don't have that, you don't have that heat production metabolism kind of thing, and some of the classic symptoms of hypothyroidism, no matter where in that axis the problem is, um, cold intolerance, maybe weight gain, which you know a lot of people think it doesn't cause dramatic obesity, but it certainly isn't helping anybody when they don't have thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. um, general fatigue, maybe muscle aches, um, skin dryness that's new or bizarre, hair brittleness, sometimes hair loss. You'll hear about the hair loss from the eyebrows. That's actually not as common as people think it is, but, but it happens. Um, if it's if it's the, for different reasons, the thyroid gland will get bigger. So if, if it's if we don't have enough iodine, and we can talk about that stuff if we want, um, or if it's an autoimmune disease, which is the most common in the United States, then the TSH is going up because it's going, hey, where's all our thyroid hormone? And it stimulates this, and it gets and it gets bigger. That's called a goiter. Um, on exam, we can you know tell that, and we can do deep tendon reflexes. You know when the doctor comes uh -huh. to me mm -hmm. with that. Um, when it when it's a slow relaxation phase, so we you know we tap and it goes up and then it's slow down. That's hypothyroidism. On the other hand, we can have hyper or at least thyrotoxicosis from a different uh, few different reasons. Then that's when you know you're kind of all popped up in general, especially younger people who get those symptoms: heart racing, tremors, heat intolerance, um, maybe weight loss despite an increased appetite and eating more things like that. Okay. Those are some of the basics of that. But we also we get thyroid nodules that we worry about thyroid cancer. And I think it's those, those, is it around yeah. one centimeter? I think if it's lower, yeah, if it's like larger or not, is that relevant? 
it, yeah, it, it matters, and it can be, it can range, <laughs> it can range from a little bitty bitty thing that we don't really care about, but maybe monitor depending on the patient's risk, mm -hmm. uh, to be in a, you know, a centimeter, which, um, unless it's a very low risk one, we'll start thinking about biopsying that. Uh, it starts getting to a one and a half, two centimeters. We're going to start biopsying all those unless they're pure cysts, meaning it's just pure fluid that built up in that for some reason. Um, but that also depends on. Uh, and this gets kind of doctory and complicated, but nodules can also make thyroid hormone. So if if somebody has hyperthyroidism and they have a nodule, we need to make sure that that nodule isn't the thing making the thyroid because then we know it's benign. So mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about biopsying it, but then we have to decide on if we want to treat that or not Okay. for the hyperthyroidism. So, so there are you know, a few things that we have to deal with. And, um, you know, thyroid cancer is not uncommon but it's also not it's it's probably the least scary cancer you can have and some of them are now being classified as not even cancer because they some of them don't have malignant potential mm -hmm. and they're very easily treated but the reason we treat them is because some of course can be aggressive and we don't want to miss those mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things that you know going on right now a lot of study trying to figure out well you know who can we not biopsy and who do we really need to treat aggressively and who can we just monitor so some studies show that those little bitty ones, we could just monitor even if they are a thyroid cancer because most more people die with them, not because of them, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. There's a little bit of that people might care about if they're worried about nodules or, you know, if they have a family history or anything like that. Um, but as far as the hyper and hypo, you know, there are lots of potential causes of those with the common ones being kind of what we talked about, autoimmune disease or, or kind of the common reasons for the, the thyroid to actually be the one with the problem, hyper or hypothyroid. But pituitary hypothalamic issues can happen too. Okay, yeah, because you said hypo, uh, we have hypo, we have hyper, and we've got lots of people now, I've seen research about Hashimoto. Uh, yeah, so that's the autoimmune disease that causes hypothyroidism. That's definitely the most common in the United States. Um, as opposed to iodine deficiency, mm -hmm. um, which is more common in other parts of the world, and that's why we put iodine in our salt, of course. So um, what does iodine exactly do? So um, let me, uh, let me this, so this digs in a little bit to... Uh, Needy and greedy. You know, uh, <laughs> so so it's, it's a little complicated, um, but so, so like I said, T4 and T4, the biological active compound and they have the you know these phenol rings that are attached um via an ether linkage to a tyrosine molecule um and then those each have two iodine atoms in the outer ring now this this gets confusing and it's not like i like memorize this stuff we don't memorize these no things. you can't kind of approximately mm -hmm. but the t4 has two iodines on the inner ring while the t3 has only one so that's where that difference comes from and if an atom is removed from the t4's inner ring then that's called reverse T3, which everyone likes to look at, even though it's very minimally useful. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't have any biological activity. So T4 is only made in the thyroid, while the T4 is converted to T3 in many different peripheral tissues um, via enzymes called deiodinases. So they take the iodines off and, and do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then they're both stored in something called thyroglobulin in the thyroid, so that when necessary, it can be released rapidly so it's a very it's a very quick functioning you know plan um but the basic biosynthesis uh it, it, it basically the thyroid traps the iodide in the follicular cells mm -hmm. um, uh, diffusion and transport into something called colloid that's in there and then oxidation of the iodide to iodine and then it incorporates into those tyrosine residues uh we're using big words globulin <laughs> um and and again the that's that's basically it, and then um, you know the uptake in, in, in the thyroid and then ultimately releasing into um, into the circulation, and then and then that conversion of T4 to T3, like I said, is important. It, it, the type one and type two deiodinases that are out there um, respond to what's going on in life, yeah. and, and trying to trying to adjust that appropriately, and that's where you know you'll hear. Well, is you know my low carb diet tanked my T three and my reverse T three went up. Well, yeah, that's what happens. That's what happens in starvation. That's what happens in chronic illness. You know, we don't need to check reverse T three to to know that. We just know it's happening. It doesn't mean it's bad per se, 
it's the body's way of working dealing, against us. Yeah, dealing with things. That's you know, why so, nutrition is really important. It's, yeah, yeah. And so whether we're trying to do that or not, it's, you know, it's, it, we'll, we'll just say it's the body's way of trying to uh, compensate. So um, uh, that's, I don't know, that, that's yeah. you know, too depth or, or uh, but there, there are a lot of things that can, that can screw up that conversion, like, um, like I said, starvation, diabetes, um, you know, chronic or acute illness can certainly do it. And then there are medications we have, some of which we use them on purpose for that, like for hyperthyroidism. But, um, you know, it's just something to be aware. We don't need to dig into the detail. Probably. Yeah. yeah. And what's the differentiation between women and men? Because we... So it, for females, um, there, there tends to be a little bit higher prevalence of you know, primary, meaning the thyroid gland, hypothyroidism. I mean, that's kind of the bottom line. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a little bit higher prevalence of autoimmune disease. So um, I think, you know, the approximate number percent of people who actually have Hashimoto's, even without thyroid dysfunction, is something like 11 to 15 percent in the United States. But not everyone has low thyroid hormone, but they're at certainly increased risk of developing that. So if somebody knows they have it, we should monitor them annually or if they develop symptoms they think might be. Um, and, and different guidelines say different things about who we should be screening. Because um, it depends on the history, red flags, anything can change the whole... Well, certainly, you know, uh, family history, females as they age, um, uh, and any of those symptoms... Uh, certainly, if, you know, if anybody had uh, pregnancy is also another one because it's very important that we don't miss it in pregnancy. So, so some of the hormone guidelines, the endocrine guidelines that that I tend to follow and agree with, um, based upon all the data, are probably a little bit more aggressive with saying, "Hey, you know, th- these are cheap tests. We should probably be screening more people." Um, whereas we can also argue that people overscreen this anyways. I think, um, but I sometimes will hear from people on the internet like. Oh, nobody checked my thyroid, and I'm very surprised because it seems like people get their thyroid checked the, the minute they walk into a doctor's office. Yeah, yeah, which is, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, from an endocrinology standpoint, there are a lot of reasons that we do want to screen it, and it, and it is cheap, so, uh, you know, it's, it's okay to get that screened. Is you know, we can discuss the, the cost-benefit ratio, but, like, the USPSTF, um, <laughs> you know, they, they kind of said, eh, we can't really recommend for or against just screening randomly, so... So our guidelines lay out a little bit more of a specific, hey, aggressive case finding, they call it, where, you know, all these situations, which turns out to be a lot of people. So we, yeah, and the thing is, you say uh, screening, but uh, can we find with, like, conventional blood tests can reveal thyroid problems? Because, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, if, I'm, if I have a blood test, I can learn anything. But it's, the blood test is just a screenshot of that current moment, Right. Yes, so that's true. So, for instance, um, you know, generally, we'll traditionally we would just screen with a TSH, that thyroid stimulating hormone, because it's so good. However, because our labs are so much cheaper and there can be uh, other issues, and I can get into those if we want, we pretty much always get another a T4 with it. Mm -hmm. Because if the TSH is elevated, um, we won't get into lab values so much, but if the TSH is elevated and the 3T4 is low, that person has primary, meaning the thyroid gland, is not functioning, they have hyperthyroidism. Now, there, there can be subclinical where the T4 is normal and the PSH is just kind of elevated. And there are some re, some areas where that's actually not abnormal. Um, obesity uh, causes more leptin hormone to stimulate that whole process and actually makes TSH up a little bit without actually having a problem. Um, kind of a compensatory thing. Um, Pregnancy, for example, the HCG hormone that from pregnancy acts at high levels just like the TSH. So it actually stimulates thyroid hormone to be a little bit overproductive and makes the TSH really low. Um, and uh, so, there, so there are reasons why we need to do that. Um, what, what would be the best uh, practice? Like if somebody wants to, like, is that TSH, you think? Is there anything? Uh, at this point, we would say it and, and a T4 with it. And a T4. Yeah. Um, so the, again, this gets into a little bit medical evaluation, but if someone came in and we thought maybe they had hyperthyroidism, mm-hmm. we could check a TSH and it's low, which means that the thyroid, if, if the pituitary is all okay, 
that means the thyroid, there's too much thyroid hormone, whether it's the thyroid gland or maybe they're taking thyroid hormone or something or a supplement with it or something. Um, and, and it's making the TSH go down. Well, if we check the free T4, let's say it's normal. But we say, well, okay, um, that's when we will definitely check a T3. T3 is a little shorter acting and, mm -hmm. and the lights aren't quite as good. But it, they're certainly good enough that if we check that, some people can have high T3 and, and we could call that a T3 toxicosis. So they have hyperthyroidism, maybe from autoimmune disease like Graves or maybe from a, a nodule or a multinodular goiter or something like that. Could and so then we know that. So that's, those are reasons to check more than just the, um, you know, the TSH. Would you ever check the pituitary gland for an adenoma that can create that uh, imbalance? Definitely. Yeah, so it's it's rare, more more rare certainly than the thyroid gland. Um, but we see a lot of, we see a lot of hypopituitarism uh, for different reasons. And you can certainly see central pituitary hypothyroidism. So if we are screening someone for some reason, this is another reason to check T4. Uh, and let's say the TSH is perfect. Let's say it's one. So for what it's worth, that's about right. Um, but uh, but somebody has symptoms and, and maybe it, it was missed that maybe they had a pituitary surgery or maybe they have a, pitu a big fat pituitary tumor and the other things weren't necessarily discussed and the whole thing gets missed. Well, they could have a really low free T4. So if we get a TSH that's one and a T4 that's really low, that's when we got to start looking at the other pituitary hormones and and we get an MRI of the pituitary gland to see what's going on. Okay. So it could, that can also happen from those things I talked about, the chronic illness, the thing called sicky thyroid, maybe, you know, extreme dietary restriction, starvation, low carb, low fat, all that stuff, maybe excessive exercise. But, but we, you know, we would hopefully get that in the history a little bit, but uh, certainly we would evaluate that. And then, you know, you said something like, can you catch it in a, in a point of time? Mm -hmm. uh, we always need to confirm these because they there are, there is some variation and sometimes things fluctuate like with illness or some sort of something going on uh, those things can all get kind of suppressed and and then they can recover so um, and sometimes in that recovery the TSH goes up because they're recovering and Coming then some, they get screened and someone goes oh oh there it is they, <laughs> they have hypothyroidism and get started on thyroid hormone when in reality maybe they didn't need to and they actually recover and everything's okay might have a loop, but it's going to go up again because it's starting to find homeostasis again, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there are all sorts of different yeah, ways that, that things do fluctuate. Uh, one example is after pregnancy, uh, a relatively not uncommon uh, issue is thyroiditis, where the thyroid itself just gets inflamed and it releases thyroid hormones. So they can get steam thyrotoxic, where the thyroid hormone's up, the TSH goes down, but then they, they can recover. But then if they have autoimmune disease and this just like triggered it, then the TSH might just keep going up and they become hypothyroid, you know, forever. <laughs> so, so these are things that need to be monitored. And then that's just clinic. You just need to kind of know that and, and monitor that. And, uh, you know, that's up to the, the doctors to do that. It's, those are just things you have to kind of be aware of if, oh. if they get. Well, and it, that's a good segue because I was going to ask you about all the minerals or the like calcium potassium, sodium, um, iron, vitamin D, uh, B12, yeah. you know, anemia, they're, yeah. they're, do they correlate? Is that? Most of those, not so much with thyroid hormone, but those are all hugely important to make sure their people aren't deficient in for some reason, nutritional deficiencies, um, because the symptoms overlap so much with a lot of these things. Uh, like you said, anemia and B12. Um, we could go off on the deep end talking about, you know, adrenal fatigue, which is not real, but people have real fatigue. So they get their thyroid checked, they get their adrenals checked, all this stuff, but they might be anemic. They might be bleeding somewhere and, and anemic. And so all these things need to get checked. All those minerals play a role in some way with everything. So they all need to be um, monitored. Now, what, what minerals are truly important with thyroid are the iodine we talked about, mm -hmm. uh, so like I said, it's essential for thyroid production. Um, it's obtained only by food, and that's why we put it in salt. Um, things that contain iodine uh, naturally are like seaweed, kelp, um, dairy products, uh, and some, some vegetables, I think. Um, Thank God you didn't say so, kale. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, uh, it, I think it has 
<laughs> and it probably has it. You know, it, I'm sure it does. Um, and and there are recommendations for how much we need. You know, it's like 150 micrograms uh, daily, uh, like for pregnant women, because that's when it's really, really, really important. Um, they might need a little bit more when they're breastfeeding, lactating, um, up into the mid 200s. Uh, and then, and it is good to know for people because uh, they'll. There are people out there who are trying to like sell iodine supplements to help thyroid. Paradoxically, which means it's, that's kind of an ironic term, is that uh, when you take in too much iodine, it can actually tell the thyroid, oh, hey, we need to settle down, and it sure. can stop it. And that's, that's called the Wolf-Chaikoff effect. And we, in, in patients who have pretty bad thyrotoxicosis, hyperthyroidism, um, we will give them potassium iodide to, to shut the thing down while the other medicines work or we get ready for surgery or whatever we end up doing. Um, so that's just something to note. I would not Play generally with that. most people take any of those supplements. Just get it, if, you know, get it in your prenatal vitamin. <laughs> it should have it in there. Um, you know, don't avoid regular iodized salt. Um, you know, I, I told you that the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the United States is Hashimoto's autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So we rarely should see iodine deficiency, but I have seen it a couple of times. Um, and it's, and, and it's, this has nothing to do with like vegans or anything like that, but it tended in my cases, it happened to be vegans who were going with sea salt only, or maybe just not eating much salt at all. And maybe their organic foods or whatever that they were using it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the, it was those who were doing organic stuff too. Um, they were hypothyroid because they weren't getting enough iodine and we checked it in their urine or their blood and, and they were low. So, uh, That's I, why yeah. everything in I moderation. No, right, right. The other supplement, um, mineral to be, uh, aware of that helps thyroid is selenium. Mm -hmm. People should not be deficient in selenium unless they're, you know, doing some strange diet that, that makes them deficient. I, I feel like I have seen it once or twice. Um, you know, I, it's hard to say why, what people are doing. It, it's in a lot of foods. It, it, it's in the soil. Um, I usually tell people to make sure they're eating um, Brazil nuts because Brazil, Brazil nuts yeah. have a lot of plenty. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've heard some other practitioners say that too much or too little of, of those, it, it doesn't work. I think they might be trying to sell selenium supplements or something. <laughs> I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but interesting that there are some some studies where uh, selenium supplementation, like real legit supplementation, has lowered thyroid antibodies a little bit. Um, it's been used in, in Graves' eye disease, so in the hyperthyroid Graves' autoimmune disease. You can get uh, the antibodies basically stimulate the, the tissue behind the eyes, and they can grow out, and, and it's a huge problem, potentially. Um, and so sometimes there, there's been some studies with selenium supplementation in that. It might be beneficial, um, maybe lowering antibody levels in, in pregnancy, uh, because there's, it, there are issues with those thyroid antibodies in pregnancy, too, with miscarriages and stuff. We don't have enough to say that people should do it for sure, but it's at least interesting, and it might be even a, a, a safe thing. Um, but otherwise, if you're eating a, a well-balanced, you know, a lot of plants, nuts and seeds, some good animals, if you care to do so, lean meats, um, fruits, legumes, you should be okay. Um, you know, there are those... Uh, plant uh, some vegetables called like goitrogens where they kind of block some of that stuff we talked about and cause hypothyroidism so you probably don't need to like overload yourself on bok choy because that's those those are the case studies where people go into what they call a mix edema coma where they're where, where they're tanked and uh, um just for a funny story maybe that maybe, maybe it's not that funny but spencer you know my my little he, he's uh, the other day, he uh, he told me he just ate a bunch of bok choy or something, and then he sent me a picture of himself, and it was a, a picture of a patient from a medical book talking about myxedema coma. Um, I don't know, nice or not, I don't know if we need to edit that, but it was funny to us because we're you know because we know all that stuff. And um, it's yeah, because everybody takes something that's so small, and we need to stretch it. We want to sell something, and we're trying to make it you know. A problem where okay. there's nothing there. Yeah, and and there's one more supplement to be aware of for people who are getting who are maybe getting their thyroid checked, um, and that's biotin. Biotin has nothing really to do with the thyroid itself, but labs that we get done, these lab assays that have to do with antibody binding and and receptors and all these things that people just think, oh, we go get labs and we have these perfect numbers. 
first of all, labs are more complicated than that. And I can't even talk to them, even though endocrinologists are like the ones who made all these labs once upon a time. But biotin interferes with that, with, with the thyroid assays and can screw up the tests. So make sure if you're going to get your thyroid checked out, stop your biotin supplements a few days beforehand, at least. That's oh. a... It's, there, it's actually a rampant problem right now because everyone's taking biotin, which is a fine supplement. You know, we need it. it. You know, probably good for skin and hair and, you know, maybe some other things. But um, and it's not bad for the thyroid at all. It just screws up the lab. So you're going to end up going down a rabbit hole when the doctor goes, oh, whoa, what's going on? And, uh, you know, nobody realized that they should either say or ask about biotin. So that's uh, that's a big deal in our world right now that we need to make sure we're asking everybody about. And that's why when you uh, when a client or a patient comes in, he needs to tell you everything so you can put everything in right. consideration so you won't have any false outcomes of the situation. Yeah. Um, you talked about, uh, we talked about, uh, you know, underactive or overactive thyroid. People think, oh, you know what, I'm gaining weight because of my thyroid. We know or we think that because someone is hyper or overactive, he's going to be thin, you know, slim and lean. And someone that has underactive um, is going to be, you know, obese and can have a slower metabolism. Right. So, to some degree, that's true. Um, but it certainly is not the case for everybody. Um, like I said, having underactive thyroid certainly doesn't cause severe obesity. But it, it is definitely bad for metabolism and weight. And for lipids and sugars and stuff like some of that, some of the fat disease that we worry about, the, the diseases of obesity um, get exacerbated. Um, but, you know, it's amazing. Sometimes we have patients who have essentially perfect thyroid hormone levels and they, they're convinced all their symptoms are from a lack of thyroid hormone. They're just maybe slightly off compared to some people go full blown. They, they have no thyroid hormone. Their TSH is through the roof into the hundreds, and they come in thinking, I don't know, I'm doing okay. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. You know, no weight gain. Maybe they end up feeling just amazing when we replace their thyroid hormone, but they're otherwise just hanging in there. <laughs> you know, oh, I didn't even realize something was wrong. Okay. And it's like, whoa, how are you even still functioning right now? And then, you know, and then we get plenty of people who, uh, you know, they think their TSH is three and a half, which is on the, you know, the upper end of normal. We, we like to get it right, like I said. You know, about 0 0.5 to 3, 2 and a half, especially for young uh, reproductive age women to, to make sure that's kind of squared away. Um, but, the, you know, then they think everything's off. Now, of course, that's when we do. We look into other things. Uh, you know, we make sure we check the T4. Um, we generally don't do a T3 for underactive because that's not going to necessarily change what we do. That means something else is probably going on. Um, but on the other hand, some people who have hypothyroidism and they get replaced, we usually give T4, right? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you've probably heard people out there going, oh, you can't just use T4, you've got to use all these other things. There's some truth to that for some people. The mm -hmm. evidence is very mixed. There's not enough evidence to say that's true by any means. And there are risks with T3 because it's a little bit, it, it's the more potent one. So, you know, got to be careful. Yeah. It. yeah, it's hard on the heart, hard on the, the bones. But... Um, I personally like to, uh, if, when I do that, if, if people don't quite feel right on their just their T4, even though the T4 levels are okay, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll experiment. In fact, with a lot of people, especially if they're struggling with their weight, I'll, I, I prefer bioidentical T4 and T3 combination so I can adjust both levels. Um, our guidelines actually recommend if we're going to do it to do the T3 twice a day because it's a short acting. But I'll tell you, my personal experience is that I like to just add it in a, a low dose once a day, kind of see what happens. And most people who do respond to that say, oh, yeah, okay, I feel better. Now, I always tell them, there's a chance this could be placebo. As long as we do no harm, to me, that's okay. We're, we're going to monitor it. We're going to make sure we don't give you too much thyroid hormone. Um, and so, in my opinion, uh, based upon the evidence, it's reasonable to consider that. But it's certainly not something you should jump to right away. And I... Even though my colleagues at, in my institute have done the ones that have studied um, armor or pig thyroid, desiccated thyroid, mm -hmm. with some uh, some benefits for weight um, and maybe preference uh, in some people, um, I I actually don't really like it. If patients really really want to try it, I, I'm okay with that. 
but it's because the ratio of the T4 and the T3 and the pig thyroid, it's not really what we want and it's harder to control. And um, so I prefer the bioidenticals that we that are easier to, to type rate personally. And plus, if it, if it works and has more side effects, why not? You know, he's going to feel better. Yeah, it's right. And it's, it's, it's reasonable. So you just have to be careful. And, and that's totally up to the doctor, uh, you know, the physician's comfort level. I know endocrinologists who won't do it at all because they just feel confident that the risks of T3 outweigh that small percent of people who might possibly benefit. We just don't know enough yet. Um, whereas, you know, it's, it's like at every endocrine conference, there's always like a point counterpoint discussion on that. Always. Um, you know, so it's, yeah. And, and because this is another area of science where we have a lot of data, it's just kind of mixed and not, it, we're not there yet. We have some genetic studies and maybe those people with genetic deidinase, remember we talked about those deidinase issues, yeah. those patients might be the ones who are statistically preferring the combination therapy. Um, but, you know, a lot of these hormone deficiencies that we deal with, they're, it's tough to perfect it. And we just do our best and, and try to work with the patients. And, and most people do pretty well. But do, do we know, like, in a hypothyroidism, like, would you have, like, 200 calories less? Because, you know, people throw out numbers, and I'm like, guys, come on. It could be a slow metabolism. Slow, yeah, that's... Slow, but we I, know, I, yeah, that's, that's hard to say. I mean, if someone has hypothyroidism, we need to, we need to treat them. And he's going to be lethargic. He's not want to yeah. be active. It's not, right. it's not only yeah, because I, of the metabolism. It's because of the whole lifestyle changes. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, right. So everybody, everybody gets lifestyle prescription, no matter what they come. Um, because the problem is, like I said, you know, sometimes people on their T4, they don't quite feel right. Um, and we try to adjust it and sometimes consider adding the T3. But we need to make sure, again, just like the adrenal fatigue thing, that first of all, that's not real. But the hypothyroidism is. But we don't want to have uh, um, we don't want to have our blinders on. And we need to make sure that, first of all, I swear over 50% of the people that see me in clinic have sleep problems that are either causing their hormone problems or making it seem like they have hormone problems. Everyone has sleep issues, it seems like, yeah. whether it's sleep or bad sleep hygiene or we're doing this right before we go to bed and the blue light screwing up our rods and cones and our circadian rhythms. Um, but their, their diet, exercise, the recovery, all that stuff. And, um, you know, we can dig into the weeds of that, but it doesn't have to be crazy protocols, you know, it doesn't have to be the paleo autoimmune protocol that isn't going to work for the vast, vast, vast majority of people, but <clears throat> just good, solid dietary stuff we talked about already. Okay. And uh, um, the effect we have, because it, it has, it affects a whole body. What the thyroid imbalances can have problems with, with our mental health, like uh, is there an appropriate screening process that should be followed, you know? Because uh, we've got people that yeah. have, have either, you know, mood changes like or depression or they're, yep. you know, aggravated all the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So any, I, I think pretty much the psychiatrist will screen thyroid dysfunction almost for every psychiatric disorder. And I don't know if that's in all their guidelines or what, but it's certainly a reason to screen because hyperthyroidism can cause people to like almost seem like they're losing you know, they're a little bit, they, they feel like it, they, they don't remember stuff, they're, they're saying weird stuff, uh, you know, it's, we call it, um, uh, what do we call it, the, uh, you know, thyrotoxic brain or something like that, where, you know, maybe they're manic um, or something like that. And then on the other hand, yeah, depression, certainly hypothyroidism certainly isn't helping depression. Uh, the psychiatry literature actually uh, digs into, a lot of them give T3 by itself when people don't even have hypothyroidism to adjunctively help treat their depression. Now, the the scholars in endocrinology have looked at the data and say, ah, eh, man, that's, eh, I don't know. And now you're given a bunch of T3, which can definitely have side effects. So we don't recommend that as adjunctive treatment. But certainly if someone has depression and they get screened and have hypothyroidism, that needs to be treated. You know, that's a reason. I mean, certainly psychiatric issues are a reason to screen. Um, in fact, I... Uh, you know, I have some issues sleeping um, personally. And when I saw my primary care doctor, who is an internist like my background, um, she uh, before getting some uh, some once in a while needed sleeping meds. She made sure to check my thyroid, even though I was pretty confident it was okay. But just in case, 
what if I had hyperthyroidism that was making me not sleep? True. So it's pretty reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's the main gland, and it literally is everywhere. People are, it can affect everything. We know what was happening, and there was a thing here uh, that happened from a nutritionist that he was giving uh, T3 just <laughs> so people can get, lose weight. Okay. Right. Um, I had a question because uh, was uh, one of my friends told me that she has hypothyroidism. She she used to be a swimmer. She still swims like crazy, two or three miles a day. She cannot lose any weight. And the thing is, when they give her um, T4, her thyroid strengths, when they stop, same thing, and nothing changes. Could it be the parathyroid hormone? Could it be T3, as you said before, that could help? Have you but seen that before? So what you're saying the thyroid, um, so she has hypothyroidism. Yes. And she takes thyroid hormone. Yes. T4. And when you say the thyroid, the thyroid gland shrinks? I mean, that's, it, that is what in theory would be we'd want by giving T4 if, it, if it, they have a goiter and, and that's one of the, we would want it to shrink if possible. Um, we would monitor that TSH and keep it, you know, where she feels good without, uh, again, doing harm, you know, maybe, in, maybe even a little lower than one potentially. Mm -hmm. it, it depends. I mean, this is very personalized. Okay. Um, but is, is it that she's not quite feeling quite right? Yeah. Plus, uh, there's not any loss of weight. Like she's right. So, so she's the type of person where we need to make sure everything else is okay. Like there's not, she doesn't have anemia. She doesn't have sleep issues. She doesn't have another deficiency. We need to do a, she needs a full evaluation for fatigue and just not being right. Mm -hmm. And we need to help her look at her diet. You know, so the nutritionist needs to look at it. The doctor needs to look at it, see where she can maybe cut some extra calories, um, things like that. And then, you know, she would maybe be someone who we would consider a trial of T3 in. But again, I can't say that definitively, but if we were just a, a hypothetical, you know, board question, that might be the type of person. Just not quite right. Not what they used to be. Um, and the T4 is making that TSH low. And they're still just, and eh, they still think they have the symptoms. It might not be. It might be totally something different and that needs to be evaluated. But some of us will consider a trial if the benefits or the potential benefits outweigh any potential risk. So we did, you know, we, we, know, we don't want to do harm, but could, I, could, you know, tell me I'd consider it. Could it be from uh, basically starving yourself, like being in a really deficit situation that that would hinder your whole... Uh, uh, well, that, that will, so that does happen. Um, that happens, and like I said, uh, that's one of the reasons we get kind of a sick you thyroid. The whole axis kind of shuts down. Uh, you know, the T4 turns to reverse T3 instead of T3, so you have low T3, and, and just stuff's kind of shutting down. Again, that's not necessarily bad if the energy balance is still in favor of loss. Yeah, because it's the same calories you, in you gain, you, Yeah, you can't gain weight like people think when they, if you go on into starvation mode, so to speak, you don't gain weight. Your metabolism does slow down, and thyroid plays a role, but it doesn't slow down under, it, like they don't change... The balance doesn't change necessarily, so, um, so everything else needs to be considered. And um, you know, and and in the past, they have done studies in weight loss where people lose weight. We're trying to help people maintain weight, and and all these compensatory mechanisms like the leptin goes down. And it's already not working well. You know, there's studies that give leptin. That's a very advanced discussion for another day. That we don't do. That. I mean, we, we can barely even. It's only indicated for like very specific genetic issues. Um, but you know, there, there've been studies where people give some T3 and, and T3 probably is a little bit better at, at weight loss. And they're endocrinologists who are old school and they know the stuff and, and they, they'll give them a little bit or they'll drive their TSH down a little bit more to help them out. Um, it's a little bit different in someone who's on the thyroid hormone. So of course their pituitary and hypothalamus aren't being necessarily affected by the diet and, and overtraining because mm -hmm. we're just given thyroid hormone anyways. Now, could the conversion be, uh, affected? Sure. But that's, and maybe that's where, you know, maybe the combination would help. I don't think we have great data. Yeah. Options. Um, and some will and some won't because it's it's not perfect clinical data. Because then again, it's calories in, calories out, right? 
Uh, yes, it's, it is a lot more complicated than that, but that is the basic equation. It is an energy balance. Um, appetite has a very complex regulation, and as does metabolism. But at the end, it, it does matter. Um, it's not... You know, it's not like the low carb versus low fat debate where no, you know, no. it's one <laughs> hypothesis and they think that that's driving it. That unless you have a, a tumor in your pancreas making too much insulin, that's not causing your obesity, your weight gain. But there are a lot of neuroendocrine complexities. That's a, a whole different lecture. Um, but it does all play a role into that equation. But ultimately, there's still that equation. And everyone's different. Everyone has different genetics. Um, everyone has different lifestyle things. Everyone has different ailments. And, uh, you know, we just try to optimize each of those aspects the best we can. Okay. I know you're a busy man. Last question. Okay. Uh, how can we have or how can we keep a healthy gland? What can we do? So I think um, you know, this gets back to the basics. So uh, I would tell patients to let's, let's work on your diet. Let's try to be a little bit more whole food based and not too restricted, uh, depending on how much, you know, their obesity is and how much we're trying to lose weight. So this is, it's very personalized, but, but a, a personalized energy restricted diet, depending on what their goals are, um, but more food based as opposed to find empty foods. That's, that's like that for everybody. Um, more plants. Fruit, you know, vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, seeds, uh, a good balance of lean protein, probably dairy, uh, you know, low, low calorie, dairy, good protein, dairy, fish, um, some poultry, um, some eggs maybe, uh, depending on other risks. Um, and, and, you know, uh, we could debate the red meat thing, but yeah, I personally think having a little bit of nice, lean, quality red meat once in a while is probably okay for most people. Um, and, uh, and then the, the exercise, you know, good, solid uh, daily exercise. I like high-intensity exercise, but everyone's different. A lot of people, we just need to get doing a walking program, um, non-exercise activity, try to not be sitting all day, which we all are doing all the time, uh, and that's horrible. We need to be taking breaks, taking walks, all that stuff. It's even in diabetes guidelines to do that. Increase our needs. Sleep. Yeah, sleep, sleep is the unsung hero. Uh, we need to... Uh, you know, work on our sleep hygiene, dark rooms, not looking at our iPhones at night, uh, maybe having some ambient noise, making sure we don't have symptoms of sleep apnea, snoring, falling asleep during the day, all that stuff, and get screened for that if possible. Um, and, and those are really the basics. Now, back to the, back to the nutrition a little bit, we need to make sure we're not avoiding the iodine or the iodized salt. And, and if there's, we're for some reason at risk of selenium deficiency, but, um, but you know, if you eat it, some nuts and stuff like that, you're probably good to go. I, that's really the most important. And if you have legit symptoms, and there, are there any other reason to get screened, pretty reasonable to get screened, probably, and, okay. uh, and treated appropriately. Okay. That, that was that were, were great insights. Um, where can we find you? You had a book? Well, uh, <laughs> if, if you want a book on fat loss, my brother... Uh, But um, yeah, uh, our, our website that we have is www.docswholift.com. And uh, I'll try to keep up with that a little bit more, um, put some stuff out there. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I have a Facebook page. It's just Dr. Carl Nadolsky Facebook page. Um, you know, and I, I, I share stuff about thyroid or other hormones. I share studies. Um, sometimes I'll take a picture of my food if I think it's what my patient should be eating. Um or other things just for a support structure for patients. And, and then along with that, you know, an Instagram and Twitter that's just at Dr. Carl Nadolsky. So I will put all the links on the those. comments and also on the podcast and the page. Um, sure. Any future plans that we, uh, well, we need to know of? Well, uh, like I said, I'm literally moving up back up to Michigan where I'm from uh, in a couple of days, and, and I hope to help that big system up there develop a comprehensive obesity treatment program. Um, I, I work with uh, some of my endocrine societies on, on some projects, uh, especially with, with the uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Um, we're, we're very aggressive in trying to improve the, the environment, uh, I guess, the, or the medical environment, especially for the treatment of obesity. 
Um, so I'll be working with, on some projects for them um, and, uh, you know, perhaps with the Obesity Society and stuff like that in, in collaboration. Uh, but otherwise, just, uh, you know, going to try to set up shop and take care of patients and, you know, keep trying to do a little bit of online stuff. I got to try to keep up with Spencer. He's a very, you know, his, that's his whole practice now is online. So he's very good at, uh, you know, spreading his net out and, and doing that stuff. And I'll try to do the same thing, especially for my patients who want to stay in touch and, and have a support structure. So so certainly check out the Facebook page, give it a like, and, uh, you know, try to share reasonable stuff that, that may help people and at least uh, keep them interested on top of things. That's great. And hopefully uh, in a future uh, video and lecture, I can have you and your brother at the same time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that might be. We can have a docs who lift debate on something. Oh, yes. You you just tell me what and I'll bring it up. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Dr. Nadolski, thank you so much for your time. And You're very welcome. Uh, and uh, I hope all the changes and everything you're doing is going to be inspiring more people and more people are going to get healthy and people are going to start lifting again. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Psychologically and physiologically, too. Yep, absolutely. Everything counts. Oh, exactly. What's on the inside that counts, both uh, up here and, and everywhere else. Exactly, exactly. Have a great day, sir. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was, uh, that was amazing. Um, cool. I'm going to... I'm going to create it. The, I'm going to start creating the video. Um, also, I'm going to put all the comments. Uh, also, if you don't want, uh, because it's with your brother, right, Dr. Left, I'm going to put it uh, all the. Yeah, links. yeah, I. I yeah, I'll. I'll uh, I can message you right now with just the basic links for our yeah. stuff. Yes, for please. My stuff. I What? <laughs>